Hello and welcome to another episode of History 3394, the official class of the Tour de France. Um, I, at the beginning of every class I say, I'm going to go really quick today and get through all this. So once more, um, I'm going to say that I'm going to go really quickly and get through all this stuff. Uh, you've probably figured out by now that, you know, the original lineup on the syllabus is kind of irrelevant, but um, we're, we're making headway. And actually, I've already gotten further than I ever have when I taught this course. The, f the first time I taught it was 2001, fall. So 911 happened, which just threw everything off, right? And we just spent half the class talking about that. And then I taught it again last fall, and the war was kind of going, so we spent a lot of time talking about that. So I've actually gotten further than I ever have before, so I'm kind of happy about that. Um, last week, we were talking about the 50s, and... Um, spent a lot of time talking about the Middle East and nationalism, especially Nasser, and a little bit about um, Europe in the, in the 50s, and that was really interesting and I think important because it showed that the Soviet Union, after Stalin's death, actually creates kind of a flexible system. And so you have a situation where Poland can, can have a, a, a de-Stalinist government, and Hungary, until it withdraws from the Warsaw Pact, is on the, the, the road to doing the same thing. And then we started talking again about Asia, a little bit about China and Taiwan, and then I started talking about South Asia, which is where I left off. Uh, and I do want to spend time on this, because I think these are all really important areas, and you don't really hear about them very often, and most textbooks gloss over them. South Asia is particularly important because it, it is uh, the area of uh, a, a great Cold War rivalry but in a strange way between India and Pakistan. India and Pakistan, it's not a question of communist versus non-communist. Neither of those countries is communist. India is a neutral country. India is the biggest so-called democracy in the world. And yet the United States actually uh, uh, sees India as, as a, a, something of an enemy uh, uh, for particular reasons. So I wanna talk about that some more. And this follows a pattern that we've um, already talked about with regard to neutrals uh, and nationalists. Um, you all kind of know where this is. If I can get the cursor, there we go. And there's India, which is just a, a really, really, really big country, uh, obviously. And here's Pakistan. Pakistan was created uh, as a separatist state um, after decolonization for Muslims. Uh, there are a couple historians who like to look at India and Pakistan in terms of uh, Hinduism versus Islam, which I think is, you know, and, and their basic argument is that the U.S. favors Islam, which I, I don't really buy into. I've never seen the U.S. be particularly, you know, uh, 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 attracted to, to Muslims. Uh, it, obviously, contemporary, we see that all the time, the kind of anti-Muslim rhetoric and everything else. So um, I tend to see it more, as I'll talk about today, as kind of a context of the Cold War. Um, and I briefly mentioned last week how uh, Jawaharlal Nehru, who was the leader of India was kind of crafting a different path, not unlike Nasser. And in fact, Nehru had been one of the uh, 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 speakers at Bandung in 1955. That's really important, that Bandung conference, which no one, you know, it's not the kind of thing you hear about. But it really does kind of create a new way of looking at the world. You had, you know, the Cold War in 1955. You have the U.S. and the Soviet Union or China, and they represent everything. And all of a sudden, you have all these other countries, the Egyptians and the Indians and the Indonesians, people like Nasser and Nehru or, or uh, 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 Sukarno, who said, no, 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 we're going to have a third way. We're not going to be uh, part of the Soviet empire. We're not going to be part of the American capitalist empire. We're going to have our own system. And, and that really upsets Dulles. Now, to the Americans, that's, I'm sorry, to the Soviet Union, that's, that's something of a victory. Because even if those countries aren't necessarily in the Soviet camp, they're kind of pulling away from the U.S. side. And so the Americans see it quite differently. The Americans see that as kind of a, a, a renunciation. People like Dulles see the world very monarchy in black and white terms. You're either with us or you're against us. And so Dulles sees neutralism or nationalism as, as an enemy or, or an alien force. So, uh, 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 you know, I, I mentioned briefly how Nehru was considered a communist, which is kind of the, the, the buzzword for, for people, right? You don't like what they're doing. Uh, they're challenging the power of American corporate capital or, or somehow uh, taking a, an even-handed approach to the Cold War, so you call them a communist. That's one way to, to discredit them, and, and we've seen that already. Um, and, and Nehru is very upset because he believes that development is difficult in the current context. And this is a theme James talked about and, and I've brought up before. Uh, uh, 
after World War II, one of the major buzzwords, one of the major concepts is development or modernization. We want to create middle classes in these countries to create educational systems and health systems to essentially make them modern, and then they can become modern consumer societies, right? Well, that's not happening uh, for many reasons, some economic, such as the dollar gap, others more because of the Cold War, where military aid becomes a substitution for modernization, and you're going to see this occur uh, in South Asia. Nehru, as much as he complained about America's lack of development or the lack of modernization, uh, uh, thought that the biggest problem was America's support of the breakaway country of Pakistan. Um, John Foster Dulles said that uh, uh, when he talked to the Indians, when he talked to Nehru and his people, they felt that Pakistan, this is a quote from Dulles, they feel that Pakistan is essentially a military state largely run by the army, that they're a martial people, that they're fanatically dedicated to Islam and may develop the urge to attack India or at least try to take Kashmir or parts of it by force. Kashmir is a, a, uh, a border area that's been in dispute ever since the, the countries were established. So the United States sees that there's great animosity between India and Pakistan and the U.S. is thrust in the middle of it, all right? Um, India has economic problems as well. It's foreign reserves, foreign currency, the dollar gap, right? They need money. They don't have enough foreign uh, currency. Was a threat to their economic planning. So on one hand, Nehru says, I'm going to go my own way. Uh, you know, I'm not going to be part of the Cold War. But on the other hand, he needs economic aid. And of course, the United States is the, uh, the uh, uh, biggest likely benefactor. Um, so you have kind of a double game being played here. The United States, on one hand, certainly wants to take India out of any possible move into the Soviet orbit. At the same time, it's continuing to heavily support Pakistan. Uh, so it's playing both sides, right? It gives hundreds of millions of dollars in aid to India, but also sends a whole lot of military hardware to Karachi, which is the, the capital of Pakistan. Uh, Richard Nixon uh, uh, and others in the United States actually want to support Pakistan. Nixon says, and he's very candid about this, he says it's extremely important that we do not appear to court neutrals and abandon our allies. So as far as Nixon's concerned, neutrality is wrong, it's an evil. We should not be seen as courting neutrals, because if we do that, that means we're abandoning our allies, which means that if we are nice to India, then we will be abandoning Pakistan. That's a really, you know, again, a black and white way of looking at the world. You're with us or you're against us. Same thing that you hear in September of 2001, right? You're either with us or you're with the terrorists. That's not new. This is the kind of approach that the U.S. takes. Pakistan's human rights record has never been anything uh, to write home about. And as we'll see, like, toward the end later, hopefully I have some tables up there which show uh, which will show how much uh, assistance, military assistance and weaponry Pakistan has received from the United States. Um, by the late 50s, Pac uh, India found itself in some really grave economic problems with, with nearly a billion dollars in foreign debt. Um, they go to the U.S. for aid. There are elements in the U.S. which want to help out India, again, in order to draw them away from the Soviet orbit. But if you're in Karachi, if you're in Pakistan and you see the United States support India, what do you think? I mean, how do you view that? That's hostile, right? So Pakistan is deeply concerned. So what does Pakistan do? If the United States supports India, Pakistan goes to D.C., and they ask for more aid, too. Okay, you can kind of see where this is all heading. India is getting money, which means Pakistan wants more money. As Pakistan gets more money, what does India do? They want more money. And what are they going to do with this? What are they going to do with most of this money they're getting? What are they going to buy with it? An arms race. You're going to see an escalating and really destructive arms race in South Asia. Both sides getting incredible amounts of weaponry from Washington DC. Okay, so if that money is being used for military equipment to be used against each other because they don't trust each other, more important question then is what is it not being used for? Economic development. And again, so the United States is subsidizing militarization rather than development. Um, the ambassador to Pakistan, in fact, very, very honestly and candidly said, U.S. military aid, this is the ambassador's words, is based on a hoax. The hoax being that it is related to the Soviet threat. Because, of course, that's what the U.S. kept saying. Well, Nehru may be in the Soviet camp. The ambassador to Pakistan is saying, there's, there's no Soviet threat here. And, in fact, outside of uh, uh, some aid to India, Nehru visited Moscow. There, there wasn't, you know, uh, any significant Soviet uh, involvement there. 
So, so what the U U.S. policy in South Asia is supposed to keep India out of the Soviet camp to placate the Pakistanis. And what's it end up doing? Leading to an incredibly destructive arms race throughout South Asia. Is this by mistake? Is this just, oops, we screwed up? I mean, they're clearly aware of what's going on. And at no point did Dulles or Nixon or Eisenhower or anybody else say, okay, this has gone on too far. This is counterproductive. Let's stop it. Let's, let's rethink these things. That never happens, all right? In fact, they see this both within the context of the Cold War, you know, kind of interjecting the Soviet Union and everything, but even more than that, in, in finding ways to create kind of economic client states. And, and, and clearly, if you continue to pump money into these economies, they will become dependent upon you. Um, things get worse in Pakistan. There's a coup in the late, in 58, uh, a general, Ayub Khun Khan, takes over and essentially institutes martial law. And the U.S. actually sees this as a positive force. Now, the U.S. is supposed to stand for democracy and liberty and self-determination and sovereignty and all that. Yet, when we have a military coup, and you'll see this all over the place, right? The United States actually sees that as a positive sign. Why? What does a military government bring to the table that allegedly a, an elected civilian government wouldn't? Order, stability. Those are the words you hear all the time. Order and stability, right? What was Franklin Roosevelt's famous little axiom about either Trujillo or Somoza? Sure, he's a son of a bitch, but he's our son of a bitch, right? And so uh, 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 the U.S. supports the Ayub Khan government. Um, there are some people who point out that it seems very hypocritical to talk out about democracy out of your, you know, one side, while on the other side supporting this repressive uh, uh, military government which institutes martial law and, and is receiving scads of weapons from the U.S. Um, however, the United States, you know, the, the National Security Council and the White House continue to insist that uh, um, Pakistan is too important an ally. You know, that the Soviet threat in South Asia is so great that the United States has to continue to support Karachi. So, uh, throughout, uh, and, and this will go back and forth. In the 60s, India actually receives more foreign aid than any other country. But then beginning in the late 60s and onward, the U.S. starts to pump tons of money into Pakistan and actually uh, uh, favors Pakistan against India. So, uh, uh, you know, when you look at it within this context of kind of uh, uh, global politics or even global terror, I mean, if, if you want to look at the biggest reason that there's instability and, you know, armed tension in South Asia that, that still exists today, I mean, border disputes over Kashmir flare up all the time. Both sides now have nuclear weapons. Okay, what's the biggest reason for that? It's because the United States pumps so much weaponry and so much money for military assistance into South Asia to both sides in the 1950s, all right? So, any questions on that? Ne yes. Um, it's kind of hard to follow coups. Uh, um, Pakistan is interesting, and, and I'm going to speak more of this when I, when I do the kind of toward the end, when I talk about the Middle East. Um, the current government, uh, Musharraf, is actually an ally of the U.S. And before uh, uh, the war in Afghanistan in 2001 was considered a very reliable ally, uh, the U.S. kind of put him in a bind there because... By attacking Afghanistan, I mean, Musharraf is, is, has had the support of fundamentalist Muslims in Pakistan. So Musharraf had to essentially stand with the U.S. He's seen as kind of America's guy, which has created real problems in Pakistan as well, because a lot of people there support Osama bin Laden and al-Qaeda, right? So, um, yeah, I mean, the short answer is it certainly wouldn't, you wouldn't, you know, mistake it for a, a democratically elected government. But in a sense, I mean, this, the kind of U.S. kind of set him up. You know, they kind of put him in there. He was, he was their guy. And now they've created real problems. Yeah. I'm going to push the button if you have it there. How is the U.S. able to maintain uh, any credibility, at least on the surface, when they're trying to pressure either Pakistan or India to sign a non-proliferation non treaty when at the same time giving them arms hand over fist? That's what Mao Zedong used to always say when they would rail against Chinese weaponry. Like, you guys have more weapons than the whole world combined. Um... You know, politically, I'm not sure how much credibility they have, but the U.S. still has both the carrot and stick. And, I mean, that, that will always give them a, a, a seat at the table to, to make all kinds of ugly metaphors. I mean, so long as they can hold out this, this incredible level of aid, then the South Asians have to listen and they have to take it seriously. 
you know, so they can't just say flip off. They just can't do it. You know, it would be, uh, uh, and if one side does, then the other one would take advantage of it. I mean, it's really kind of an armed, you know, eyeball to eyeball kind of thing. You know, you do that, I have to do that, you know, kind of, kind of stuff, right? Any, any others? I'll talk very, very briefly about Indonesia. And there's a map up there of Indonesia, which is an archipelago, a big island chain. Indonesia is important. I think I've mentioned this before. In the World War II era, uh, 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 it was part of the Dutch. It was a Dutch colony, the Dutch East Indies. All right. And why are the Dutch East Indies important? Why is it oil? Dutch Shell, right? That's where the major source of its oil is from. Becomes independent and is led by uh, a guy named Sukarno. And um, uh, uh, Sukarno, like Nehru, like Nasser, uh, declares his neutrality in the Cold War. And so the United States uh, sees this as a threat. Sukarno actually receives way more economic assistance from the Soviet Union than from the United States, something like 100 million versus uh, 15 million. So there's a significant difference there. By the late 50s, once more, like Nehru, like Nasser, uh, American officials are convinced that Sukarno is a communist, right? It's the kind of looks like one, acts like one, smells like one, talks like one, all that kind of thing. So um, they decide that they're going to they're going to do them in. Uh, there had been elections in Indonesia in 1957, and communists had gotten about 20 percent of the vote. Um, the labor unions in Indonesia had been influential, and they had supported Sukarno. So that proves it, right? So Sukarno's kind of in their in their sights. Um, Ironically, one of the first things the U.S. does to try to upset the Sukarno government is to look for groups in Indonesia to fund that will subvert Sukarno. So who do they go to? Who's the first group that gets American money? Radical Muslims. Because they're opposed to Sukarno because he's basically, he's a lefty, he's secular. So the U.S. goes to the most radical right-wing Muslim elements in Indonesia and gives them money to form an anti-government group. All right. And again, you know, you want to talk about blowback. Blowback is the idea that people you help later come back and bite you on the ass. Right. It's kind of people like Noriega or whoever. Right. This is a good case of that. The U.S. ends up supporting these fundamental Muslims. And, and of course, the probably the most famous example is, in fact, Al Qaeda and the Taliban in, uh, in Afghanistan. Um, so Su Sukarno basically is in America's sights now. Um, the U.S again begins the rhetoric. He's a communist. Uh, the ambassador says that uh, Sukarno is part of a dangerous snowballing communist trend. They talk about communist infiltration in Indonesia. The CIA begins uh, contacting anti-government groups, especially in the military, and they begin to lay the groundwork for Sukarno's overthrow. By late 1957, significant amounts of American weapons are pouring in to Indonesia to various rebel groups. In fact, the U.S. ends up supporting conf competing rebel groups who actually like, are fighting against each other instead of fighting against Sukarno. I mean, basically, American weapons are showing up all over the place, and everybody's getting them, whether they're on the same page or not. Um, by early 1958, it looks like Indonesia is about to blow into a civil war. Um, the U.S. insists that Sukarno has to go. However, all these rebel groups who the U.S. is arming are really can't get their act together. They're not coordinated well. Uh, many of them uh, actually have different views. I mean, you know, the radical Muslims and the army, you know, will have a different idea. So... Um, Basically, the U.S. realizes that the rebellion, it has spent money on, it has sent the CIA to help out with, uh, it has sent arms to various groups for, isn't going to work out. Uh, they realize, too, that if they intervene with forces, that you know, it would probably be a disaster, and that the entire third world would turn against the U.S. It's the same thing they recognized at Suez. I mean, one of the major reasons the U.S. didn't intervene at Suez is because it would upset the international order, and stability is important. And you have the same thing going on in Indonesia. So uh, uh, the coup fails. Now, not for want of tri trying, the coup fails. We'll revisit this in about six or seven years when things are different. But again, the U.S. can't tolerate the idea of an independent Indonesian state. So it tries to oust it. It fails. But the, the writing's on the wall. And, you know, again, this is a case where militarization is a substitute for modernization. I mean, Sukarno was actually, in a sense, doing the kind of things that rhetorically the U.S. said that he should do. 
he was trying to create a modern state, you know, with electricity and development. But who was running it in Indonesia? Who was, who was going to be responsible for these programs? American corporations? No. These would be status programs. And what does the IMF or the World Bank or any of these international lending institutions say to you if you say, I want a state-run electrical system or I want a state-run communication system or I want a state-run industrialization program? What do they say to you? Yeah, you, you don't get it. It has to be privatized, right? So anytime you establish public institutions at the expense of private investment, especially American private investment, you will uh, uh, become an enemy of, of the Westerners, okay? So this is Asia, which is continuing a pattern. I mean, the U.S. is supporting reactionary elements in places like Taiwan or Pakistan against uh, a statist public institutions. In the meantime, arms are flooding in into Taiwan, into Pakistan, into anti-government groups in Indonesia. So the U.S. once more is using arms as a substitute for, for development, all right, in Asia. Any questions there? Okay, so what's going on? We're at the end of the 50s. Really pivotable, pivotable. <laughs> that sounds like a word Bush would use, right? Misunderestimate, strategery, pivotable. A very pivotable decade. <laughs> a very pivotal decade. Uh, you say something wrong and then it's kind of hard to get over it. Maybe I'll just call Reagan a mass murderer again and kind of get out of it that way. Um, uh, this is an important decade. I mean, uh, the Cold War has continued. The arms race has escalated. And I do have some data later which shows the level of, of military assistance that the U.S. is sending out all over the world. But even more than that, the, the so-called Cold War has really gone global. So now it's not just Eastern Europe, it's not even you know, China, it's Korea, it's in Vietnam, it's in Guatemala, it's in Egypt, it's in South Asia, it's in India. Basically, you know, close your eyes, throw a dart, and you'll find pretty much hit a spot where there is some kind of Cold War issue going on. Principally because the United States not only is committed to containing or getting rid of communism, but also to challenging neutralism or nationalism wherever it exists too. So within that context, people like Ho Chi Minh or Gamal Abdel Nasser, or Sukarno or Nehru or, or uh, uh, um, Arbenz or, or Mossadegh or whoever become challenges to American hegemony because they are not like wildly and openly responsive to American capital penetration in their states. Right? They choose either public or national economic strategies as opposed to these globalized liberal economic ideas that the U.S. is essentially trying to use coercively in these places, all right? Is that cool? All right, so what's going on? At, 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 at decades end, uh, some major developments take place, which I want to go through quickly. The first and probably the most important, which is a real kind of a watershed in the Cold War, is the successful uh, satellite test the Soviet Union launches called the Sputnik. It's the first artificial satellite. Uh, which is launched in August of 19, uh, I'm sorry, October 1957. Just a few months prior to that, the Soviet Union had launched the first uh, ICBM intercontinental ballistic missile, which I forget what the range is. It's quite, quite, ah, shit. I can't remember the range of those. A medium, medium range is about 1,100 miles. Do you know what an ICBM's range is? I, I forget. It's about 3,000, okay. Sputnik is way worse though, because it's satellite technology. This raises the prospect of essentially having a missile that can hit anywhere in the world, including the United States, right? I mean, uh, uh, so um, in the United States, there's a great furor, a great fear once Sputnik is, is successfully launched. I mean, the Americans are, you know, especially conservatives and people who are, you know, advocates of the military industrial complex are really, you know, quite frantic. Oh, my God, they have satellite technology. They can attack us now. They can have a first strike. Uh, uh, the country is in peril. This is when you start to see uh, a real flurry of people like building, uh, um, you know, the underground shelters and civil defense programs. And uh, um, the government passes the National Defense Highway Act, right? So you can build more highways so troops can be transported more quickly. Uh, my favorite is the National Defense Mathematics Act, right? To spend more money on education in the United States. You can't just do it because kids should be smarter. You have to do it because we need good mathematicians in order to build our own Sputnik so that they can take on the Soviet Union, right? If you ever want to get government money, you attach defense to it and, you know, they'll, they'll open, give you a blank check, you know? If it, you can't just say this is for education or this is for, you know, health or whatever. It's got to be, the, you know, the National Defense whatever act. So um, the U.S. is really frightened that they're falling behind in the arms race. 
And in fact, uh, and again, another irony, the Democratic Party really starts to exploit this. Eisenhower is still president. He's a Republican. So the Democrats, people like John F. Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson, begin to attack Eisenhower. Why? Because he's soft on communism, right? The guy who's overthrown governments all over the world is soft on communism. And in fact, during the 1960 debates, Kennedy attacks Eisenhower because he says he has allowed a missile gap. I don't have that. Yeah, I do have that up there. The missile gap, missile gap. There's a missile gap. We're falling behind. There was a missile gap. The U.S. was overwhelmingly ahead. But in the, 50, in the late 50s, Congress even set up a commission called the Gaither Committee. And the Gaither Committee came back and said, oh, we're falling behind. We need a 50% increase in military weapons and military budgets. Okay? Why? All right? The United States, between 1952 and 1962, had seen its stockpile of nuclear weapons rise from 1,200 to 22,000, which I believe was 10 times more than the Soviet Union had. I don't have the numbers right, but I'm pretty sure it was a tenfold increase. In fact, between 1958 and 1960 alone, at the very time the Gaither Committee is saying we need to tr double our defense, 50% increase in our defense, but America's nuclear stockpile tripled in three years, all right? So in fact, there was a missile gap overwhelmingly in favor of the U.S. The U.S. had 4,000 nuclear-capable aircraft. It could have launched 300 of them, less than 10%, which means if there's a massive Soviet attack, which they couldn't have launched because all they had was ICBMs, not satellite technology anyway. So even if the Soviet Union launches an all-out overwhelming attack, the United States, with only 300 aircraft, can simply destroy the entire Eurasian continent. Yeah, there was a missile gap overwhelmingly in favor of the United States. Nonetheless, Kennedy uses this against Eisenhower and Nixon, claiming they're softies, they're wimps. Okay? I mean, Richard Nixon got out sleazed, and it took a Kennedy to do it, which is, which is saying something, because Nixon was pretty good himself at you know, deception and lies, but the Kennedys were better. You know? So, um, you know, so the, the Democrats begin to attack the so-called missile gap, and, 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 which is quite ironic, right? Because the Democrats now have become you know, the party of wimps and weakness and everything else. I mean, don't forget the liberals are responsible for the Cold War. The liberals are responsible for Vietnam. The liberals are responsible for the military industrial complex. The liberals are responsible for Korea. These are all liberal wars. You know, American aggression is made, you know, made by liberal Americans. You know, I mean, this is something that historically has just been turned upside down on its head. So that, you know, people like John Kerry now have to answer about their toughness. You know, in a sane world, people would be, you know, in 19, so I'm, I'm on one of my Germans have just bombed Pearl Harbor rolls. In 1976, there was a debate uh, during the campaign between the vice presidential candidates, Walter Mondale for the Democrats and Bob Dole for the Republicans. You all remember Bob Dole? Conservative Republican. You know why Dole got in trouble during that debate? Because he said that all the wars since World War II had been democratic wars, liberal wars, and Dole caught hell for it. Dole was right. Dole was basically saying the Democratic Party is a party of aggressive hawks, right? He caught hell for it. And then all of a sudden Reagan comes in, does 180 on it, says the Democrats are wimps and they're weak, and gets away with it. I mean, it's truly ahistorical. It's truly, you ever, you know, the next time you're having dinner with your family, just throw that at them, right? It just, you know, don't listen to CNN and the New York Times. This, this is, you know, listen to me, right? Or listen to Dwight Eisenhower who is, can't believe he's been attacked. So on his way out of office, right before he leaves office in January of 1961, he gives a really incredible speech, which I have up here, I linked to it, uh, where he talks about the military-industrial complex. It's his farewell address on January 17th. It's a very famous speech. Here you have a five-star general, the guy who ran the uh, war in Europe during World War II, who's president, who's responsible for the Korean War, who's responsible for the greatest increases in America's defense budget ever, who's responsible for this massive exponential increase in nuclear weapons, who's overthrown governments wherever you can close your eyes and throw a dart on the globe, who's being accused of being soft on communism. And he finally gets it. And he issues this warning, this very poignant and powerful warning about the so-called military-industrial complex. He says, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. We must never let the weight of this combination endanger our liberties or democratic processes. Who does he sound like? He sounds like Taft. He sounds like all these people who were railing against the national security state. All right? American liberty, American democracy is being undermined by what? 
by American militarism. This is Eisenhower saying it. This isn't, you know, Noam Chomsky or, or Norman Vincent Peale or Bertrand Russell or some whacked out professor at some small liberal arts school in the Northeast. This is Dwight David Eisenhower, General of the Army, President of the United States, talking about the power of the military industrial complex. And in a sense, it's a slap at Kennedy, right? Because Kennedy's talking about the missile gap and everything else. And Eisenhower saying, whoa, that's not the case. What we have to do is be concerned about our democracy, our liberty here at home, because, because this militarization is really, is really undermining it. Right? We spend, Eisenhower also has a, another part that people don't ever talk about, which is really powerful. It's about the, the universities. And he goes off on American universities. He says, uh, in the universities, uh, a government grant for military research has become a substitute for critical thinking, for critical inquiry. And that these universities, all they're worried about now is getting government money from the CIA or from the Defense Department. It's like the Michigan State Group, right, in Vietnam. And these things are going on. You set up a government, a, a foundation like SACE or CSIS at Georgetown or Hopkins or wherever. And this money starts flowing in. How much did you say the Ford Foundation spent? Did, did you have a number on that? I mean, the government money, Ford Foundation. Okay, I mean, this so if you know if you want to get government money, you know, you set up an institution and you start doing Pentagon research or CIA research, right? And you know, the money comes flowing in. What does that do? Eisenhower is railing it, not some liberal left-wing professor. It's Eisenhower saying this isn't what the universities are set up to do. Read the whole speech. It's it's really worth looking at. I mean, it's incredibly prescient. You know, uh, uh, especially coming from a guy whose you know, career is really based on aggression and militarism. And even he kind of gets it because he'd been burned. I mean, he'd seen, you know, he'd been burned in 1960 by Kennedy, who was accusing him of being soft. You know, the missile gap and everything else. And, you know, I, uh, Eisenhower was a really controversial guy among historians, how to figure him out. And there are actually a lot of, yeah. What's the date on the speech? Uh, January 61, right before he leaves office, two days before Kennedy's inaugurated, three days before Kennedy's inaugurated. Um, so this is, this is really, you know, I mean, it's worth, it's, it's worth looking at, okay? What else is going on? All right, um, right before Eisenhower leaves office, or, or as Eisenhower's leaving office, there are many, many major issues, but two I want to talk about. One, Germany, two, uh, the Soviet Union and China. All right, first, Germany, very quickly. 1958, as Eisenhower's ready to leave office, he's kind of winding down. His health is suffering. He's had, what, I think two heart attacks. Uh, his Secretary of State, John Foster Dulles, is, has terminal cancer. I think he dies in 58. So, 59? But he leaves office in 58. Christian Herter takes over. So, by 58, you start to see kind of a, 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 you know, kind of they're running on autopilot. However, Germany remains a critical issue. Um, 1958, the West had still refused to recognize East Germany, the German Democratic Republic, as an independent state, right? So the West is still maintaining this idea that Germany will be unified. But if Germany is to be unified, will it be, how will it be unified? Under which kind of system? Obviously, a U.S. capitalist system. So um, the United States is still maintaining that East Germany is not an independent state. And, of course, the Soviet Union um, continues to insist that, the, the, that uh, uh, East Germany will not be unified with the United States. And, in fact, the Soviet Union is concerned that the West Germans, the U.S. allied Federal Republic of Germany, uh, will take action against, um, against the East. So uh, Nikita Khrushchev, who was the Soviet Union, uh, insists that all of the countries who were involved in the World War II partition of Germany sign a peace treaty to finally resolve this, to grant East Germany, the GDR, its independence, give it full control over all of Berlin. Berlin is still an issue, all right? Um, and to finally resolve the German issue. I mean, this is 1958. The war ended in 45. Thirteen years later, Germany has still not been resolved. Okay? Uh, so Khrushchev uses this. Um, uh, uh, and and 58, he begins to make an issue of, of Germany. 1960, 1958, 1959, 1960. This remains in flux. What are we going to do about Germany? Uh, Kennedy is not, uh, John Kennedy, I'm kind of going back and forth here chronologically. John Kennedy is elected and is brought, uh, comes to office in 1961. Um, by this time, there is a crisis in Germany. Um, about 30,000 East Germans are fleeing into the West every month. 
So there's this massive exodus. Remember 1953 when that happened, there was a big uprising. Um, Khrushchev decides to make an issue of this because Berlin is important. Khrushchev says, um, Berlin is the testicles of the West. Every time I want to make the West scream, I squeeze on Berlin. Okay, this is a lightning rod. This is, this, you want to make America hurt. So um, Khrushchev continues to insist that Berlin become entirely part of East Germany, which will become independent. Okay. Kennedy meets with Khrushchev in 1961 at Vienna, and Khrushchev won't compromise. Kennedy's very upset. He says, that son of a bitch won't pay any attention to words. He has to see you move. So Kennedy comes home. He mobilizes the reserves, asks for a $3 billion increase in defense sp uh, spending uh, for Berlin. So what happens in Germany? Okay, the East Germans respond. And what do they do in Berlin in August of 1961? They build a huge wall to separate East from West Berlin so the people from the East can't flee in to the West anymore. Okay? Uh, Kennedy, and, 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 and of course, this will become a major propaganda weapon throughout the Cold War, the wall, the wall, the wall, which is obviously really evil in uh, Berlin, although it's apparently okay in Palestine from, from you know, what's coming out of Washington and, and, and Israel today. Um, the United States will use this as a major, a major issue. In fact, the U.S. and Dulles actually had thought about this idea of separating Berlin years earlier. So this doesn't exactly take the U.S. by surprise, and it's not necessarily unwelcome. It diffuses the crisis. You know, nobody wants to see Germany and Berlin continue to erupt and become a powder keg. So uh, the Berlin Wall actually becomes a stabilizing force in the Cold War. There's a, 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 an image of it, which I'm sure you've all seen. <coughs> um, the Berlin crisis finally dissipates in late 61. Uh, as part of the kind of quid pro quo, the U.S. agrees, and this is a real fear by the Soviet Union, that West Germany not have its own nuclear force. Um, there was a real fear, uh, not without reason, that the Federal Republic of Germany, West Germany, would become nuclear, would go nuclear. And you can well imagine what, you know, how frightening that would be to the Russians who have, you know, a history so to speak, with, uh, with the Germans. Uh, the wall will remain as the most visible symbol of the Cold War. And in fact, when the Cold War finally ends, the most visible symbol of it is, of course, what? It's the destruction of the wall, right? Finally, in the 60s, another major issue that's going to be important and which the U.S. really misplays is relationships between the United States, I'm sorry, between the Soviet Union and China. Um, the U.S. throughout the entire Cold War, remember, uses this Soviet or this communist threat, right? He's a communist dupe. I mean, Ho Chi Minh is a communist, and uh, Nasser is a communist. You name it, right? And the U.S. never accounted for differences in the communist world. There was this monolithic, homogenous <coughs> communist conspiracy. That's how they refer to it, the international communist conspiracy. And they were all alike. So, in fact, I mean, Vietnam is a really good case of this, where uh, 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 the Vietnamese and the Chinese hate each other. I mean, China had invaded Vietnam many times and had controlled Vietnam for centuries. So uh, uh, Vietnam always wanted to break away from China. In fact, to the point where uh, Ho Chi Minh, after World War II, remember when the French come back in, Ho is actually willing to kind of deal with that and, go, and soft pedal France. And Ho Chi Minh, his famous line is, I'd rather sniff French shit for five years than eat Chinese shit for another thousand years. Basically, the French will come back in, but the white man's day... You know, the colonial white man's day is past. They're not going to stay here long. They'll be gone before you know it. If the Chinese come back into Vietnam, we'll never get rid of them, right? So the U.S. never responds that way. They don't understand, for instance, that, remember, Stalin had supported Jiang Zhixi in China against Mao Zedong, right? Stalin had refused to support the, the Greek rebels because he made an agreement with, uh, with Churchill that he wouldn't do that. So the communist world isn't monolithic. They're quite different, too. But the U.S. never really recognizes that. And there's really a pivotal moment, a pivotal moment, in the late 50s, where once again, the U.S. kind of misses out. Um, the Soviet Union, after Mao Zedong takes over in 49, and especially because of the Korean War, develop closer relationships. However, by the mid-50s, you start to see a break once again. Stalin and his successors never really liked Mao Zedong for lots of reasons. On one hand, I mean, Mao is a challenge to their kind of communist rule. I mean, they're the first communist revolution, the Bolsheviks. And now China's even bigger. China's a bigger country than the Soviet Union. So you have kind of a, a, a challenge to communist rule. But even more than that, ideologically, they're quite different. 
I mean, the Soviet Union by the mid 50s is actually a very conservative bureaucratic force. They don't do anything crazy. I mean, we've already talked about every time the U.S. actually challenges the Soviet Union, the core, what's the, what's the USSR do? Every single challenge, what does it do? It backs down. It's Mao Zedong who's saying, we want global revolution. Mao becomes an icon to people all over the world, especially in the third world. I mean, you go to Africa, to Asia, to Latin America, and there will be Maoist sects. There will be Maoist groups. One of my friends was in Santa Barbara in the 70s. He was part of a Maoist you know, reading club or something like that. So they were even in Santa Barbara, right? And that's what Reagan was talking about when he was governor. And he was right. He was right. So uh, uh, Mao, you know, really kind of assumes the mantle of global revolutionary. And the Soviet Union, they're kind of old and creaky and decrepit. So, you know, the kind of the communists in China, they have energy and youth and vigor. And, and in the Soviet Union, they're kind of old and decrepit and falling apart. So there's some real tension already in the mid-50s. In 1956, Mao Zedong announces a cultural campaign called Let a Hundred Flowers Bloom. I talk about this just because I love talking about, you know, these kind of Mao's, Mao's use of language was beautiful. He was always talking about tigers and mountains and flowers and this really poetical stuff while he was like, you know, killing people. But um, he announces his Let a Hundred Flowers Bloom campaign, which is supposed to be an intellectual opening in China. Well, the intellectual opening becomes a bash Soviet Union campaign. And all these poets and artists begin to talk about how they despise the USSR. And so the Soviet Union is quite upset and they start, you know, they, they send diplomatic messages to Beijing saying, you know, come on, you know, what is, what's all this hostility about? Why are you doing this? Uh, uh, so uh, feelings between Moscow and Beijing begin to get worse and worse. By the late 50s, Mao Zedong announces the Great Leap Forward. If you're familiar with the Great Leap Forward, it's an agricultural collectivization campaign. It's a disaster. It's an utter disaster. I mean, tens of millions of people may die. Ten million people may have died from famine. It was just absolutely ridiculous. Um, and the Soviet Union, you know, criticized it from the start. They said, this is going to be going to be a mess. It's not going to work. I mean, they had their own experience with bad collectivization. Mao did it anyway. Uh, so the Soviet Union continued its attacks on, on Beijing. Mao Zedong is upset. Uh, he says to the Soviet ambassador, you never trust the Chinese. You only trust the Russians. You Russians are first class. We're Chinese are among the inferior. We are dumb and careless to you. So, you know, there's really a, a, a you know, the, the relationship is quite badly strained. Um, Mao Zedong accuses the Soviet Union of actually having goals of taking over uh, Chinese um, uh, territory, uh, um, you know, so, so relationship between the, the Soviet Union and, and China are quite bad. By 1960, they're irretrievably sour. Uh, and in fact, the Soviet Union begins to withdraw advisors and, and engineering teams and things like that from, um, from, from uh, uh, the People's Republic of China. By 1960, this whole idea of a communist monolith was just shattered. It just didn't exist, right? So the good old days, you know, when, when, they, were, when they were chums, you know, uh, those days are gone, right? They, you know, uh, but the U.S. never recognizes that, and they continue to insist in the 1960s that they're all the same. Ironically, uh, the biggest proponent, there were people in the United States who said, look, we need, to, we need to divide these two countries. Remember, the U.S. still does not recognize China. Who has the Chinese seat at the United Nations? Chiang Kai-shek, Taiwan, right? So in the 60s, there are people in the United States who are saying, look, this is unrealistic. It's time to actually like grow up and recognize that China is a legitimate state. It's there. We're not going to get rid of it. You know who the biggest advocate of this was? The biggest advocate of recognition of so-called Red China? Senator from Tennessee, Al Gore. Al Gore's father was actually a real liberal. And Gore is the one who kept saying, look, we've got to recognize China. There were a lot of people who said, you know, look, this is ridiculous, right? But the United States, especially during the Vietnam War, cannot do that. And it takes, who finally figures it out? It's Nixon does. I mean, you know, we'll, we'll talk more about that. Nixon finally decides to play the China card and break them apart from the Soviet Union, right? So by 1960, the world, you know, it's hard to say it's a safer place. I mean, you don't have kind of the same intense tensions that you did in 1945. But clearly a phase in the Cold War has ended, 1945 to 1960. Um, the United States has overwhelming power in 1945, continues to have overwhelming power in 1960. The arms race has escalated and the U.S. has a massive advantage in the so-called missile gap. Uh, the United States is continuing its program of kind of liberally globalizing the world, 
looking for areas for investment and trade through the International Monetary Fund, through the World Bank, and through uh, uh, basic American corporate intervention in other places. When states emerge which don't do things the way the United States wants them to, as in Guatemala or Iran or uh, Indonesia or you know, Egypt, what does the U.S. do? It takes measures to try to contain or oust these governments. And perhaps most importantly, uh, although the United States talks about development and modernization, it militarizes the world. It does so in the aftermath of the Cold War, and SC-68 is crucially important in this because it basically announces a global program of militarization and, importantly, military Keynesianism here at home. So military uh, uh, programs become not only a way to maintain friendly states everywhere in the globe, but also a way to maintain a viable economy here at home without establishing public institutions or redistributing power and influence. So the Cold War is fairly important. Things are going to change in the 60s, and you're going to start to really see for the first time the limits of American power. You see it in Vietnam. You see it in else, elsewhere. Right? Any, anything on all this stuff before I move on? Move on. Okay. So we're going to start talking about the 60s today. And uh, we'll start with Kennedy. Um, mostly Latin American stuff. Uh, as I went through this, I realized just how important this was. I mean, uh, uh, the 60s is essentially the decade of Vietnam, right? Because that's the major war that continues to, to drag on and, and um, um, becomes, you know, the major global issue of the time. If Vietnam had never happened, then we might well today be talking about Cuba in the same way or, or Latin America in general in the same way. Uh, because the United States is deeply involved in those regions. It just so happened that Vietnam becomes the place where the United States finally makes this major stand and actually has its shortcomings exposed. Um, in a sense, Vietnam had the bad fortune to be the place where it happened. I know that sounds kind of zen, but uh, uh, the kind of conflict that occurred in Vietnam, I think, was going to happen, given America's mission in the Cold War to develop these states on friendly capitalist lines, to help one's friends, to hurt one's enemies, to develop these global institutions that would uh, 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 enable America to conduct this globalizing mission. I mean, it's still, in a sense, all about the open door, right? So Vietnam happens to be the place where everything kind of comes to a head for reasons that James has enunciated that we've talked about um, otherwise. Uh, Vietnam also becomes the place where America's limits are exposed, where they're finally clear to see. I mean, it's kind of hard to imagine in 1945, if you could fast forward, that Vietnam would be the place where the U.S. got stuck in the mud, okay? Why would that have happened? I mean, you know, it's kind of funny. Uh, 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 people often start, you know, kind of talks about Vietnam or books or articles about Vietnam with the words, why Vietnam? It's kind of like that commercial, you know, back in the day for Time Life books, why Vietnam? A question a child might ask, but not a childish question. I prefer to say, why not Vietnam? I mean, in fact, if you're looking at the world in the early 60s, why would you be worried about intervening in Vietnam? This, what did Lyndon Johnson call it, a pissing country or a half-assed country, something like that? It's small, it's backward, it's led by this short ascetic guy with a big beard. You know, Johnson's often going off about Ho Chi Minh. The U.S. has overwhelming power, staggering firepower and technology. And it has, you know, ideology and it has you know, social scientists talking about modernization theory, and it has, you know, Brown and Root building, you know, bridges and ports and roads. I mean, why wouldn't the U.S. get involved in Vietnam? I mean, it's done that. It did it in Guatemala. It did Egypt. It did, uh, uh, you know, uh, Indonesia. It did Korea. Why wouldn't it do Vietnam, right? Well, it doesn't. It fails, okay? But that's not the only place where America's shortcomings are exposed, and Latin America really becomes an interesting case for that. And I want to talk about that, especially in the Kennedy years, but also into Johnson. Uh, Eisenhower's president, the election of 1960, um, John F. Kennedy of Massachusetts runs and basically attacks Eisenhower from the right, from a conservative military standpoint. Kennedy says there's a missile gap, we've become weak. He's inaugurated and um, in his inaugural address, I want to play the first two minutes of it, hopefully I'll be able to pick it up on this. Uh, but listen to the first two minutes and listen to the rhetoric here. It's really kind of interesting and I think important. We observe today not a victory of party, but a celebration of freedom, symbolizing an end as well as a beginning 
signifying renewal as well as change. For I have sworn before you and Almighty God the same solemn oath our forebears prescribed nearly a century and three quarters ago. The world is very different now, for man holds in his mortal hands the power to abolish all forms of human poverty and all forms of human life. And yet the same revolutionary beliefs for which our forebears fought are still at issue around the globe. The belief that the rights of man come not from the generosity of the state, but from the hand of God. We dare not forget today that we are the heirs of that first revolution. Let the word go forth from this time and place to friend and foe alike that the torch has been passed to a new generation of Americans born in this century tempered by war, disciplined by a hard and bitter peace, proud of our ancient heritage, and unwilling to witness or permit the slow undoing of those human rights to which this nation has always been committed. Okay. I mean, listen to the rhetoric there. What's, he, what's Kennedy willing to do? Is he saying, well, we're going to do a little bit? No, what's he say? Pay any price, bear any burden, uh, help any friend, oppose any foe. We will do all this and more. How do you do more than that, right? So, um, you know, clearly then Kennedy is, com you know, and this occurs three days after. What did Eisenhower say three days before that? He had talked about the, the, the damning power of the military industrial complex, essentially saying, hey, man, let's, let's step back from the brink. What is Kennedy saying? We will, you know, we will do all this and more, okay? An interesting thing I want to I wanna also play for you. That same day, Robert Frost, very well-known poet, uh, read a poem at Kennedy's inaugural. He had actually written a poem, but he couldn't read it because the sun was so bright. He was an older man. He was like late 80s, I guess, already. Couldn't read it. So he read one from memory. And it's kind of interesting. He picked a poem called The, the Gift Outright. And a friend of mine who's a poet brought this to my attention. And it's really striking because I'll put the, 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 the play the audio and also put up the... Uh, the, uh, the, the words to it, but it really fits in really well with this theme. So I'm going to play Robert Frost for you. The land was let, me, let me pause that and then put the, the lyrics up too. Oh. Thanks, Kimosabi. The land was ours before we were the land. She was our land. She was ours in Massachusetts and Virginia, but we were England, still colonials, possessing what we still were unpossessed by, possessed by what we now no more possess. Something we were withholding made us weak until we found out that it was ourselves we were withholding from our land of living, and forthwith found salvation in surrender. Such as we were, we gave ourselves outright the deed of gift was many deeds of war to the land vaguely realizing westward, but still unstoried, artless, unenhanced, such as she was, such as she would become. I mean, check that out, man. What, what does that poem sound like? So this is going to play English 101 for a minute. I mean, look at that. That is a, a kind of a testimony to manifest destiny. You know, the best line in it, you know, for me is, is right here, which is really striking. You know, I'd never, you know, heard this. But, you know, look at that. The deed of gift was many deeds of war, which is basically saying, you know, American aggression, American war has given us all we have today. You know, the land was barren. It was virgin. And we had to come in and, and conquer it and make it real. Okay. I mean, this is perfect. This is Kennedy. This is, you know, uh, uh, um, Kennedy has an incredible uh, posthumous legacy. I mean, people love the guy, right? Uh, Kennedy was the civil rights president. Anybody know anything about Kennedy and civil rights? Kennedy had to be taken dragging, kicking and screaming to do anything for African Americans because he didn't want to lose Southern votes. LBJ has a far more real 
claim to having a, a, a civil rights legacy than Kennedy ever did. Uh, you have, um, you know, Oliver Stone talking about, you know, Kennedy was going to get out of Vietnam, and that's just poppycock. That's ridiculous. Kennedy was escalating the war in Vietnam. Kennedy was the consummate Cold Warrior. If you're going to pay any price and bear any burden and help any friend and defeat any foe, you're not going to cut and run from Ho Chi Minh, right? So Kennedy, you know, really has a, a great, you know, posthumous PR. It doesn't at all fit in. You have to judge the guy by, the, by his record. And he had his chance and he basically blew it, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's really an unmitigated record of disaster in a lot of ways. I mean, he makes the wrong moves in so many places with catastrophic consequences. Nowhere more so than in Vietnam and in Latin America. Yeah. It's on the web. I can't remember. It was it not. I, no, it wasn't anything like that. It's just striking that he would choose that because, it, in a sense, it was far more appropriate to, to Kennedy. You know, that the deed of gift was many deeds of war. I mean, that's that's a really powerful line. It's you know, but if you look at the whole thing, he's basically it's 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 a testimony to a, to American expansion and American aggression. I mean, Kennedy conducted himself this way. Kennedy, uh, 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 you know, conducted himself with vigor. You know. Where act, they call themselves action intellectuals. Uh, he brought a bunch of young people from Harvard and other elite schools in. He called them the whiz kids. Uh, the new frontier, right? I mean, it really was this macho. I mean, Kennedy carried himself with a great deal of macho. You know, he, he was a man's man. I mean, you know, we were joking earlier before class about, you know, Marilyn Monroe basically giving him a lap dance in Madison Square Garden in front of the world for his birthday. But this was Kennedy. I mean, he was a man's man. This is a kind of a Sinatra, Scotch and Cigars kind of world. You know, it's not kind of touchy-feely Dr. Phil kind of stuff. He's, he conducts himself with vigor, you know, the way he says it in that accent. And, and they're going to take on the world, and they're going to change it. They're going to do good things, right? Um, so he brings in all these people who, who are action-oriented. Uh, the best known is probably Robert McNamara, who become infamous during Vietnam. Uh, McNamara had been the head of Ford. Uh, he was, a, he was a, a member of the Strategic Bombing Survey in World War II, becomes the head of Ford and basically turns Ford around in a very short period of time. Ford had been in, real, in the doldrums and, and McNamara had turned it into a viable corporation once more. So uh, he becomes the Secretary of Defense and he'll essentially become associated with Vietnam. A lot of people will refer to Vietnam as McNamara's war. Um, McNamara was action oriented. He wanted statistics. He wanted something you could touch and feel. At one point, somebody had handed him a memo saying, you know, Vietnam is, is, is going to turn out badly. And McNamara throws it down and he says, uh, where is your data? Give me something I can put in the computer. Don't give me your damn poetry. This is the way he thinks. So what becomes the hallmark of American success in the Vietnam War? The body count, right? Oh, we killed 200 of them last week and they only killed 30 of us, so we're doing way better, right? This is kind of how McNamara sees it. Oh, we flew 400 sorties and blew up 13 installations, so we're doing quite well. This, it's all statistical. It's data, right? So um, I'm still waiting for, you know, kind of percentages of pacified villages in Iraq to come out. I think they learned their lesson. We haven't heard. Oh, did they? Well, I, I don't think they'll stick with that long. Yeah. Well, they, yeah, you, you still see that today, you know, 35, and they're always insurgents or militants killed, you know, you could blow up, and the same thing in Vietnam, I mean, the body count, I mean, anybody who was there, any account you read of it, I mean, the body count was just ridiculous, you know, you see, if, they, what was the, if they're dead in Vietnamese, they're VC, you know, you could get R&R, &R, you get promoted, I mean, the body count was important, and in the same way, yeah, 35 militants, so they're either insurgents or militants in Fallujah, I mean, it could be a, a wedding party, for instance, you know, or something like that. So, I mean, but this is pure McNamara, and that's my point. And actually, Rumsfeld is morphing into McNamara. They're starting to look a lot alike, which is really creepy. Anyway, <clears throat> but I digress. <clears throat> Kennedy comes into office in 1961. Now, this is really a critical period. We've talked a lot about what's going on in Berlin, Sino-Soviet split. In addition to that, with, and this is connected to the Sino-Soviet split, I wanted to save it, uh, Nikita Khrushchev essentially sees that Mao Zedong has taken the lead in kind of this global revolution that in the third world especially people are looking to China, Mao, as their icon. So there are Maoist groups sprouting out all over the place. So in 1961, 
Khrushchev wants to try to reclaim the revolutionary mantle. Bolshevism had been revolutionary, right? That had been the first communist revolution. And people all over the world looked to communism, looked to the Soviet Union as kind of the icon of human liberation and human advancement and progress and so forth. And so Khrushchev wants to reclaim that. So he makes a speech in 1961 saying that from now on, the Soviet Union is going to support wars of national liberation. Does he say communist revolution? No, he says wars of national liberation. This is a message to Africa, to Asia, to Latin America, saying even if you're not communist, if you're trying to get rid of your colonial masters, the, the, the Dutch or the Portuguese or the British or the French or the Germans or whoever, we will support you. Right? And this, this strikes a dagger in the heart of Kennedy because he's going to pay any price and bear any burden and do all that good stuff. And now Khrushchev is saying we will support wars of national liberation. So it's, you know kind of you have this irresistible force in this immovable logic moving inexorably toward one another with the entire third world as their battleground kind of clash of the titans kind of thing so Kennedy's going to do this but he's going to do it differently than Eisenhower see what was Eisenhower's main defense doctrine what, how was Eisenhower going to take on the world massive retaliation Eisenhower was going to give the air force everything it needed and give them all nukes and boom let them go basically Eisenhower's line was if you mess with us you face annihilation but can you really use that kind of a threat in a localized conflict can you blow up a country because there's a guerrilla insurgency you can't really get away with that and they know that so what essentially Kennedy during the campaign says Eisenhower has weakened the United States by this reliance on nuclear weapons by this reliance on massive retaliation and imminent destruction because most insurgencies know that the US isn't going to come in and blow up a country because of you know a guerrilla activity so Kennedy announces that he's gonna have a new approach to the world referred to by the acronym CI CI stands for counterinsurgency and insurgency is essentially a guerrilla uprising a communist usually guerrilla uprising so counterinsurgency means that rather than threatening massive retaliation the United States is going to establish counter insurgent forces symbolically Kennedy goes to Fort Bragg creates a special warfare program and gives everybody there a little hat which is a Green Beret. That's how the Green Berets get started. They are kind of the best of the best. You know, silver wings upon their chest. 100 men will test today, but only three will win the Green Beret. I'd sing for you, except, you know, it might end up kind of like a Backstreet Boys thing, you know, just don't be ugly. Anyway, so Kennedy announces his new doctor. Kennedy, you know, he was, he was an action intellectual. Not only was an intellectual, but he took, so he had read Mao Zedong, and he was familiar with guerrilla war. And he was an expert at it, right? So he goes down to Fort Bragg, and he creates a special warfare school, and he gives them Green Berets, and, you know, I think the Navy SEALs get started after this. This is kind of the, the advent of special forces in the U.S. military. It's to take on communists, you know, at the point of contact. We're not going to have to, you know, we're not going to send B-52 screaming over the skies to, to bomb every jungle in the world it's really funny there was a in 1957 I found this um, when I was doing my research on Vietnam uh, 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 an Air Force general said uh, something to the effect that never in my wildest imagination can I can I believe that b-52s will be flying and dropping bombs in Indochina which is exactly of course what b-52s did but what this the point there was Indochina is a, a guerrilla conflict in the jungles b-52s are useless there this is an Air Force general saying this and this is essentially what Kennedy was saying of course, Kennedy and Johnson ended up doing that very same thing, right? Because they were essentially bereft of anything beyond that. But Kennedy is basically saying, I, you know, you can't send jets and bombers, fl you know, screaming over jungle environments to blow the hell out of everything, right? You need counterinsurgency. You need to meet them at the point of contact through special forces, through civic action programs, through development to win their hearts and minds give them a reason to avoid communism give them a reason to choose our way of life show them development show them what it's like to have a health care system show them what it's like to have an education system give them an infrastructure and then we don't have to worry about communism we don't have to send the b-52s to blow them up they will choose our way of life we will have won their hearts and minds and as cynical soldiers said very briefly after getting bogged down in vietnam grab them by the balls and their hearts and minds will follow because the hearts and minds approach never worked because it was never really attempted because it really never could have been attempted because nationalism and neutralism were far more effective programs for national development for people in the third world than the IMF and the World Bank 
or American corporate largesse ever could have been. Everything came with strings attached for people who were trying to get rid of colonialism and develop national sovereignty. It wasn't going to work. Nonetheless, Kennedy sets out. He will develop a counterinsurgency program. And he gets tested very early on in the most dangerous area in the world. Those are Kennedy's words. He's referring to Latin America. And it's mostly what we're going to talk about. And as I said, if it weren't for Vietnam, we'd be talking, I think, a lot more about Latin America. We may be talking about the Cuban War rather than the Vietnam War. And in fact, the first thing I want to talk about is Cuba. Castro, si Yankee, no, that was, uh, uh, the Cubans used to say that, and an American supporters of Fidel used to say that. So I want to talk a little bit about that. On January 1st, 1959, if you've seen The Godfather, you, you've seen the photos of this. Uh, You've seen the stills, right? On January 1st, 1959, Fidel Castro's motorcade enters Havana and the American-sponsored dictatorship of Fulgencia Batista flees. We talked about how Batista came to power, remember, in 33-34 when uh, the U.S. had supported Machado and then he was ousted by Grau San Martin, but then the U.S. turns on Grau San Martin when he actually announces reform programs and they put Batista in. Batista had been a general. I believe he had also been an official of an American electric company doing business in Cuba. I could be wrong about that, but I think he had some connection there as well. He clearly has corporate military ties to the United States and he is America's client or puppet or whatever derogatory or derisive term you want to throw at him. Castro comes into power clearly on an anti-American program. He had been, uh, in 1953, had actually been arrested uh, uh, when he and a group of rebels tried to take over the government. They had attacked the Cuban barracks, Moncada barracks. They had been arrested. And Fidel makes a brilliant speech where he stands up in typical Fidel fashion and speaks for about four hours. He was a lawyer. He gives kind of a four-hour defense of himself, and he finishes with the line, history will absolve me. And he's thrown in jail, but then he's later released as part of a general amnesty. Comes to power in a late, I'm sorry, January 1st, 1959. Not unlike China in the sense that people on the ground uh, there kind of understood Fidel was going to win, especially there was a New York Times reporter, Herbert Matthews, who was writing back stories. He was in the, the Sierra Maestre with Fidel and, and, the, and the rebels and Che and, and Raul, and he was writing articles saying, you oh, know, this is a very popular man. Batista is, is corrupt. He's not going to survive. There's actually, speaking of the Godfather, there's that one scene, and it's essentially out of Herbert Matthews, where, remember, uh, uh, Michael Corleone sees uh, 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 the rebel, you know, uh, basically kill himself but take out four cops at the same time. And everyone's talking about how Batista is going to consolidate power. And Michael Corleone says, I saw uh, a gorilla today kill himself, but he took out four cops with it people who are willing to do that are likely to win. And that's essentially what you know, people on the ground were saying, the rebels will probably win. So Castro does win. It shouldn't have come as a surprise to anybody. It's not necessarily a surprise, but at the same time, it's not good news in Washington. Castro attacks American gangsterism. I mean, that part's true. There were, I mean, Havana was kind of, there, Vegas wasn't Vegas yet, so people went to Havana gambling and you know everything prostitution you name it it was kind of a, a place for american gangsters to hang out uh castro condemned the platt amendment condemned american uh, imperialism fidel says and as soon as he comes to power he knows the u.s is out to get him right he knows that he's not a popular man at the white house so one of the first things he says is what happened in guatemala will not happen here okay che, um, yeah che che Guerrera. His kind of his right hand man, you all know Che, he's on every t shirt, right, in every boutique in America now. Uh, che has become an icon. Thank God he's not alive because I'm afraid he'd be like doing commentary at the re conventions this week or something like that, you know. Uh, it'd be pretty funny, you know. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> Che on TRL, right? Uh, uh, oh God, it's, it's kind of frightening. Che, uh, there was a story in the New York Times not long ago. Che, the, che has become an icon, he's become a fashion icon. I mean, the amount of money, I don't know if the photographer who snapped the famous shot gets it or who, but I mean, it's like in every boutique in the world, there's Che on t-shirts, Che on scarves, Che, Che everywhere. It's, it's really incredible. But before he became, you know, kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, an icon of the VH1 awards, fashion awards or something like that, he was a revolutionary. And um, he had been in Guatemala in 1954. He was a doctor. Che Guevara was a medical doctor. And legend has it that in Guatemala, he sees the coup and he has to decide whether he's going to pick up his medical bag or a gun. And he becomes a rebel. He becomes a guerrilla. 
And so he had been in Guatemala and he'd seen what the U.S. had done there. So Fidel and Che vowed, not, not here, that's not going to happen. Nunca mas, right? It's not going to happen here. Fidel visited the United States shortly after taking over in April of 1959. He stays in Harlem. Great PR move. He goes to the heart of Harlem. He's mobbed. Crowds there just go nuts over him. Everybody wants to touch him. I believe he meets with Malcolm X while he's in Harlem. Uh, he's wildly popular. Um, Eisenhower, however, refuses to meet him. He asks for a meeting with the president as the leader of sovereign Cuba. Eisenhower refuses. There is no evidence whatsoever, and this is, for historians, this is an important question. Was Fidel a communist? I actually don't think it's that important a question. I mean, clearly Fidel comes to office. He assumes power with a clear understanding that the United States will not like him. There's no question about that. Batista was their boy, you know. Whether he was a communist or not can be answered. In fact, he wasn't. There's no evidence whatsoever. And in fact, the Communist Party of Cuba had opposed Fidel. They told him he was going too fast and he needed to slow down. That Cuba wasn't ready for a revolution yet. So Fidel wasn't a communist. There's really no evidence at all that he was. He was a good liberal reformer. He had come from a very well-to-do Cuban family. Uh, Fidel himself actually was voted Athlete of the Year in Cuba. You may have seen photos of him in his baseball uniform. He played for a team called Los Barbudos, the bearded ones. Uh, he was a pitcher. Um, he actually had a tryout, I think, with the Washington Senators. You know, they weren't terribly impressed. Uh, so uh, uh, um, he came from a very, very bourgeois family, you know, middle class reformer. He's a lawyer himself. I believe he was first in his class. Brilliant guy, right? Um, but it doesn't matter. You know, it's the duck test. Is, is he a communist? Is he, so what? I mean, the United States is out to get him, and he knows it. And I think that's what's critically important. So the U.S. gives him various ultimata. When he, you know, when he comes to the U.S., they said, you need to respect U.S.-owned property. What's that mean? Respect U.S.-owned property. No nationalization, no expropriation. They tell him that he has to align with the United States in international affairs in the Cold War. They tell him he must allow moderates to keep their influence. And who are moderates, as far as the U.S. is concerned? Batista's people, right? So you've just taken over a country as the sovereign independent leader, and all of a sudden the United States gives you these ultimata. What are you going to do? You're not going to do that. What does Fidel do? He nationalizes petroleum refineries and institutes a land reform program. Who's the biggest loser in that? Biggest landholder in Cuba, I said before, was Richard Kleiber, owner of the King Ranch, biggest landholder in Mexico as well. Fidel nationalizes U.S. companies, and guess what he does? It's the same thing all these other countries had done. When you nationalize, when you expropriate a company, you have to pay them. You have to compensate them. You just don't take it and steal it. You pay them. And how do you pay them? What do you base your payment on? Tax records. And what had all these American corporations been doing for all these years? They'd been vastly understating their wealth in order to avoid taxes. So Fidel gave them what they claimed they were worth. Most of them refused it. There are still, you know, lawsuits today. They're in, you know, all these people, of course, are in Miami. They're still filing lawsuits. Uh, uh, recently, a, a couple uh, uh, Miami Cubans filed lawsuits against uh, a couple foreign firms because they own land which they claim is still theirs. Fidel expropriated it. Okay. Um, all these American corporations actually have grants given by the Cuban American Foundation of Miami so that when they take over, they can go back to Cuban Coca-Cola and McDonald's, all and they'll have franchises good to go. And the Cuban people may have something to say about that. Um, yeah, I make no pretense of so-called neutrality on Cuba, I think. You know, as you'll see, what, what's done is just outrageous. I mean, if you want to talk, you know, we'll, we'll see. But, uh, uh, um, I mean, Fidel, you know, basically rejects these American ultimata from the beginning. He begins a land reform program. He nationalizes uh, American companies. He executes about 600 of Batista's officials. He doesn't see them as moderate. There are, I mean, you know, he, everyone talks about the human rights atrocities. There were 600 executions, and some of them are, are filmed. I mean, you have a couple where these Batista officials are standing there. They're making speeches, you know, with their hand waving. All of a sudden, they're just gunned down in front of the firing squad. Um, uh, most, however, weren't executed. Most of them bolted to Miami. Um, Castro evicted the U.S. military mission. By mid-1959, really within months, the Central Intelligence Agency had begun working with anti-Castro exiles to oust the revolution. They would begin training in uh, places like Nicaragua, actually, because it wasn't left-wing at the time, but especially, of course, in Miami. They would have paramilitary groups working in the Everglades. Uh, um, 
it's, it's funny, you know, talking about uh, supportive terrorism uh, by America's, by, as a signatory to various conventions on terrorism and human rights laws and so forth, the U.S. has violated, I don't know how many, agreements by allowing these Cuban military, paramilitary groups to train in the Everglades. And they literally have, you know, armed camps who are planning to go back and overthrow a government training with, I mean, in clear view of American authorities, with the support and sympathy of American uh, authority. So this begins in, in 1959. This isn't anything uh, new. Um, in, 1950, in 1960, in March of 1960, Eisenhower orders the CIA to begin militarily training these exiles. Initially, they had uh, worked on their own. The CIA begins military training uh, of these people so that they can invade Cuba. They do this right after Castro signs it, a trade deal with the Soviet Union. It was a deal for the Soviet Union to buy sugar. I think it was sugar for oil. Uh, Castro says, or Khrushchev says, the Monroe Doctrine is now, you know, Vi uh, it doesn't, it's irrelevant. You know, we no longer accept the Monroe Doctrine. They sign a trade deal. And at that point, uh, Eisenhower says he's got to go. So they begin uh, uh, to ramp it up in uh, uh, 1960. Castro nationalizes foreign properties. Land reform continues. Uh, the U.S. then suspends all exports to the island and begins an economic boycott that continues to this day. The goal is to strangle the Castro revolution, get rid of him, and put a reliable client back in power. Break.